Hey y'all, it's Amanda. I am back. And today I'm finally able to record the video that I've been working on for the past year. The way I stumbled on this case, I work from home. So when I'm working, I mainly listen to live trials. I started watching this trial and I could not believe how this person was found guilty. I took it upon myself to kind of start digging into all of this. And the more I dug, the worse it became. And I ended up reaching out to this individual's family and just because people were being so rude to them online. I'm not going to repeat what it was because it was disrespectful. And, you know, I just wanted them to know, like, not everybody who watches this trial thinks, oh, yeah, he must have done it just because he was arrested for it. So I thought this would be a good case to cover. Considering it's a more recent case, I am going to go into more detail as far as the trial is concerned. The media attention surrounding this case is what makes it kind of difficult to report on. Because, as we all know, the media kind of spins its web of the story they want you to know, and they don't give you all the facts. And that's what I found when I started doing my own personal research on this case. So I'm asking you to please, even if you have a preconceived notion on this case, please just come with an open mind. Because I promise you everything you see on the media is not true. I obviously can't go into every piece of evidence that was presented at trial. So I'm mainly just going to touch on the things that came across as weird to me while I was watching the trial and things that I now have answers for that wasn't presented at trial. Just based on the evidence in this case, even if you have a preconceived notion, you might walk away looking at, at this case differently. This crime occurred in 2019 in Columbia, South Carolina. A young woman named Samantha Josephson had called an Uber. She was intoxicated. She got into a car that she thought was the Uber. So this is the case of Samantha Josephson and the wrongfully convicted Nathaniel Rowland. Samantha Josephson was born on August 13th, 1998, in New Jersey, to her parents, Seymour and Marcy Josephson. She also had a sister named Sydney. She attended the University of South Carolina, where she majored in political science. She also had recently received a full rights scholarship to Drexel University in order to study international law. She was a senior in college at the time this crime occurred. On March 29th, 2019, Samantha and some of her friends decided to go out to an area known as Five Points. Basically like a college strip with a lot of bars where all of the college kids hang out. Samantha separated from her friends when she arrived at the bar when she spotted other friends and her friends said this was not unusual for them to do. So around 2 a.m., she was ready to go home, so she called an Uber. And this also, according to her friends, was not out of the ordinary for her. At 2.09 a.m., when she thought her Uber had arrived, Samantha got into the back seat of the car, and the video of her entering that car would be the last time she was ever seen alive. The following day, on March 30th, Samantha Josephson's body would be found by turkey hunters in a field in Clarendon County, South Carolina, which is about 65 miles from Columbia, South Carolina, where she was picked up. She had 120 stab wounds to her head, neck, back, right shoulder, right hand, right leg, and right foot. Later that evening, Nathaniel Rowland would be arrested and charged with the kidnapping and murder of Samantha Josephson. Nathaniel Rowland was born on April 13th, 1994 to Henry and Loretta Rowland. He is a very good young man. And when I talked to him and I, I talked to him yesterday and he told me, he said that wasn't him and I believe him. 
He also has siblings. Mrs. Rowland would describe him as a kind young man who finished high school, played basketball in college, and was active in his church. I'm behind him 100%. But I can tell you one thing. My son is innocent. And I know that from the bottom of my heart. Nate's family and supporters have stood by him before, during, and after this trial. In their opening statements, the prosecution accused Nathaniel Rowland of circling Columbia's five point, waiting and looking for someone to kidnap, before allegedly picking up Samantha Josephson and killing her on March 29th, 2019. The prosecutor also stated that once Samantha entered the back seat of the car, she was not able to escape due to the child locks being activated. Samantha fought for her life. And remember this part because it's going to be very important later. He said she kicked her attacker so hard that the only way her shoes were still attached to her feet were by the ankle straps. She had scratched her attacker so hard that it had ripped her fingernails. He said she fought for her life while she was stabbed a hundred times with a utility knife. He ended by explaining different types of evidence to the jury, direct, circumstantial, things like that. All things being considered, the simplest explanation is the truth. With all things being considered, the simplest explanation is the truth. We believe that the simple explanation is that Nathaniel David Rowland kidnapped Samantha Josephs. We believe that the simple explanation is that Nathaniel David Rowland murdered Samantha Josephs. The defense came forward with a powerful opening statement, in my opinion. They negated each and every claim that the prosecution made. And going a step further than that, they made sure that the jury knew before starting to present this case that you would hear about DNA test results from Samantha Josephson's body. And they claimed that there was none. Opening statements are opening statements. She fought. And because she fought, she did get some evidence for you. That's right. Nathaniel's DNA is not there, but someone else's is. Multiple someone's. And remember those swabs that the crime scene agents took from his car? More DNA that does not belong to Nathaniel Rowland. The first two witnesses to take the stand were Samantha's boyfriend, Greg Corbishley, and Samantha's roommate, Tegan Berry. They basically just set the foundation on who Samantha was as a person, where they were the night in question, and how Samantha ended up at Bird Dog that night. Her boyfriend stated he was out of town, and her roommate stated she was with Samantha at the beginning of the night, but they went their separate ways when they reached the bar, which is not uncommon when they spotted other friends. Next to take the stand was Marcus Williams. He was the Uber driver that was supposed to pick her up from Bird Dog the night of her murder. He said that he had received the ride request through Uber. So once he got there, he tried calling Samantha. She didn't answer. And he said he drove around for about 15 minutes. And after that, Uber sends you the option to cancel the ride. So he canceled it and went home. He also stated that he voluntarily gave a DNA sample when he was contacted regarding her murder. Anders Lee testified stating he and a childhood friend were hunting on his family's land near New Zion, South Carolina, when he was scouting a field for turkeys. And on the way back, something to the left caught his eye. So he stopped and stated the more he looked at whatever it was, the more it looked like a bot the more it looked like a body. So he called his friend over to look. He stated the area is in the middle of nowhere, just farmland and woods. Andrew Yi was the manager of the Bird Dog Bar, and he also provided video surveillance footage from the night in question, which I found to be very interesting considering the area she was picked up at is such a busy area, and there were a lot of potential witnesses standing outside. Day two of the trial was one of the most interesting. 
we saw the prosecution's star witness. It's honestly appalling to me that this woman got on the stand and said the things she did. So we heard testimony from Maria Howard. She claimed she was dating Nate at the time of the crime. On the night of the 28th, Nate was supposed to spend the night with her. But when she woke up, he wasn't there. When asked how she knew he was not in the home, she stated, If I wake up, the cover was still the way that I put it. However, when asked where he slept when he stayed at her house, Would you all go to bed together? No. Where did you expect him to stay if he was staying with you? In the living room. If he normally slept on the couch, then how did you know he wasn't at your house when you woke up? Because the blanket on the bed was the way you left it the night before. Maria also stated she went to bed the night of the murder around 12 to 1 a.m. At what point did you or do you go to bed? It was around 12 to 1. So what time do you go to bed? Around 1.32. You go to bed that night between 12 and 1 a.m.? Yes, ma'am. And that Nate was still asleep downstairs on the couch when she went to sleep. She stated she woke up around 5 and he was not there. She expected him to be there to take her to work that morning. She claimed to have called both of his phones trying to figure out where he was so he would be there in time to take her to work. What did you do when you woke up and he wasn't there? I called his phone and I texted him. Did you get a response? No. However, when being questioned by the defense, she stated the phone was cut off due to non-payment. And whenever you woke up and he wasn't there, that's when you start calling him? Yes, ma'am. And no response? No. You still can't get him to answer the phone? No. Do you remember if his phone was working on the 28th and the 29th? Could you call it? Oh, no. She allegedly went to Nate's car to ask where her work shirt was because she had the rest of her uniform on. And she stated that he had washed the shirt but that it was still wet. She asked where her visor was for her McDonald's uniform. And he allegedly told her. What did he tell you? That it was in the country. And what did you say to that? Why would it be in the country? And what did he tell you? It had blood on it. I'm going to need you to repeat that. It had blood on it. So according to Maria... She questioned him, why does my visor have blood on it? And he simply told her, you tell me. Mind my business. Mind your business. Did you ask him again? Yes. And what did he tell you? Mind my business. She then testifies that she gets in the car with him and he drops her off at work. This is one of the many times that the prosecution will have to correct her because she missed a part of the story that she's supposed to be telling. Now she backpedals and states that on the drive to work, they stopped at a gas station. And what, if anything, did you notice about the car at that point? That it was like dry blood in the car. Where in the car? On the dashboard and beside the seats. And where else did you see blood? In the back seat. In the back seat. Was anything else in the back seat? It was a sheet over the, over the back seat and the back of the driver's seat. Could you see anything in the back seat besides the sheet? Blood. She claims that he allegedly told her he was going to clean out his car while she was at work. And before that, did he tell you what he was going to go do while you were at work? Clean his car. When he picked her up for work that day, he was still wearing the same clothes as the night before. He was wearing the same clothes. The same clothes he would have murdered Samantha in. She stated when she got home, she banged on the door like the police because she didn't have an extra key. And that when he opened the door, he looked shook. Like the prosecution had her explain what this word meant. It was a waste of time. What did he have on when he came to the door looking shook? The same clothes. But he was supposedly perfectly fine that morning, you know, with dried blood in the car on the way to work. So at this point in Maria's testimony, we're supposed to believe that Nate came to her house to give her a ride to work the morning merely hours after he stabbed a woman to death over a hundred times in his car, had the same clothes on, and was acting completely normal until she came home that night. 
So Maria continues walking through her day. She says she goes in the house, she takes a shower, and when she comes outside, he's cleaning his car. I went outside. And what was he doing? Cleaning the car. But I thought he was cleaning his car while she was at work. Maria stated the car smelled like chlorine and she saw bleach bottles in the car. Could you tell what he was cleaning it with? It smelled like, the car smelled like chlorine. This is the interior of Nate's car. The black interior of his car. You see no discoloration and it would definitely be discolored if bleach was used inside the car as Maria testified to. She then stated she needed to go to her mom's house to pick up her rent and that he let her drive the car, the bloody car, and she agreed. And while you're driving, what is he doing? Cleaning the car still. Still clean. With what? Like some type of wipes. Did you ask him about that? Yeah. What'd you ask him? Where do you get them from? Why are you cleaning the car with wipes? What'd he say? Not my business. What, if anything, does he have on, have on his hands when he's doing this? He had, like, the surgical gloves. I think this testimony is insanely stupid. But we will continue because it gets better. And by better, I mean worse. At any point, do you leave again? No. Um, where's your daughter? She was at daycare. Do you have, ever have to go get her that day? Yes, because I forgot she was at daycare. I was so tired. Do y'all see where I'm going with this? She stated that her and Nate drove to the daycare together. Was there any conversation between you and Mr. Rowland about her getting in the car? He told me he don't want her in the car, but I had no choice but to go get her. Did he tell you why? Because it was blood in the car. So she put her daughter in the bloody back seat in her booster seat. She claims the following day she saw Nate's car on the news. When is the next time you know anything about this case? What do you see? Um, when it was on the news, I seen that she was, the, she was missing and then they showed the clip of his car. And what did you think when you saw the car? It all made sense to me now. What do you mean by that? The, um, the blood, she's missing, that's his car. Now the prosecution gets out ahead of what the defense is going to bring up. Asks her about conflicting statements that she gave to the police. She stated the day the police came to her house to interview her and they had a search warrant for her home. She was too tired from working to remember all of the details so she must have left some stuff out. So were you tired or well rested when you talked? I was tired. Exhausted. And were you able, were you trying to be helpful when you talked to them? I was. Were you able to tell them everything at that point? I thought I told them what I could at the time. Your alleged boyfriend murdered a complete stranger and you left information out? I don't care how tired you are. You're not going to leave anything out. She said that the police then searched her home. When they asked if she tried to call Nate while the police were there, she told them no. She didn't try to call Nate because she knew his phone was off. But earlier she called him even though his phone was off. But now she's not going to because it's... Yeah. So now we go back into some details that the prosecution thought Maria messed up while giving her testimony. She didn't notice it that morning. She forgot about that little detail the first time she told the story. Oh, but we're circling back around because Maria didn't tell the story right. If this man was 100% guilty and the state had the evidence to prove that, they would need this woman with this BS story. I'm sorry, it irritates me to no end. But it gets worse. It's not just Maria that's the problem here. She stated on the 29th at 1.30 a.m. he was wearing a light gray Nike hoodie and windbreaker pants. But remember, earlier she stated she was asleep between 12 and 1 a.m. But now she remembers what he was wearing at 1.30 a.m. She then remembers that she should probably mention that the cleaning supplies Nate was using to clean out his car would have her DNA on them. So it would surprise you if your DNA is found anywhere on any of the items used to clean up. He got them out of my house. So of course my DNA gonna be on it. That's my cleaning stuff. 
It was in my house. Would we expect it anywhere else? No. Now, based on the statement she gave the cops on April 3rd, she stated that she was not aware there was blood in the back seat of Nate's car when she put her daughter in the car. And you told the investigator at that point that you didn't know that there was blood in the back seat. And, I, and that probably was the day that I was tired. You told him if you had known there was blood in the car, you never would have put her in there. Is that right? Right. Or basically confronts you on that and says you already knew when you put your daughter in the car that there was blood in there, right? That you were putting your daughter in the back seat and there was blood in there. Yeah. She states she would never put her daughter in a car that she knew had blood on it. However, she previously just stated that earlier that day there was blood in the car and he was bleaching it, so... Which is it? You didn't have a choice but to put your daughter in the car or you wouldn't put your daughter in a car with blood in it. The defense, the one good job they do during this cross-examination, because I do have a problem with the defense in this case. The one good thing they do is they simply say to Maria, so you didn't have a choice to drive the bloody car to your mom. You didn't have a choice but to drive the bloody car to pick up your daughter. You had a choice though when you got in that car and went to pick up cigarettes later on. No. Of course, the prosecution objected and the defense had no further questions. Next, a sled special agent testified that the following items were retrieved from inside of a trash can outside of Maria's home. A sheet and napkin with suspected blood on it, a white grocery bag with suspected blood on it, a yellow grocery bag with a towel inside with suspected blood on it, a white grocery bag with blue vinyl gloves and paper towels with suspected blood, a multi-tool with suspected blood and hair on it, this is the alleged murder weapon, a khaki shirt with suspected blood on it, a duct tape roll with suspected blood on it, a white grocery bag with cleaning supplies inside, dark colored pants and a dark colored Nike sweatshirt. When sled agents searched the upstairs of Maria's home, they found a pillowcase on her bed with suspected blood on it. But Nate didn't sleep in the bed. He slept on the floor of the couch. Oh, important detail I must mention to you before we, get, before we move on from Maria. Maria Howard, who was allegedly seeing Nate on a daily basis and was his girlfriend, could not pick him out of two photo lineups. Two times, Maria identified the wrong black male in the lineup as Nathaniel Rowland. On day three of the trial, we heard from investigator Dawn Claycomb, and she presented many blood-soaked items to the jury that Samantha was wearing when her body was found. Items such as a lace bralette that Samantha had on over her bra, Samantha's shirt with the investigator stating there was so much blood on the shirt they could not tell its original color as well as the wedge sandals she was wearing that night. Next we hear from Ryan Dwayne, a DNA analyst and this is where the case blows up. Nathaniel Rowland is excluded as a possible contributor. Was uh, Mr. Rowland included or excluded as part of that? Nathaniel Rowland is excluded as a possible contributor. 